Today, we're going to explore the iShares MSCI India ETF by looking at who administers it, the past performance of the underlying index, the tracking error, the cost and liquidity, and finally, the risks and the opportunities involved. I'm making this video to create a summary package so you can compare this ETF with other ETFs which I've reviewed on this channel and hopefully save you a bit of time. We're going to be using the same research framework which I use for all of my ETF reviews, and this is going to be free to download somewhere below. So back to the ETF. The ETF was created in 2012 and is administered by BlackRock. BlackRock is the largest provider of exchange traded funds in the world with over $2 trillion in assets. The European headquarters is based here in the city of London. Because of this huge scale, they really benefit from economies of scale and can push down those expense ratios. It also means that they can diversify into all sorts of different markets, like this one for the India market. The ETF tracks the MSCI India Index. That contains 86 large and mid-cap stocks. As of June this year, then the annualized return of the index was 0.92% per year. This is pretty poor to be honest, but what makes it even worse is that because of the tracking error, the annualized return for the same time period, the five years, is actually 0.27% for the ETF itself. In real terms, if you would have actually invested in the ETF five years ago, then you would have lost money because of the cost of inflation. Since inception in 2012, because of the fees and because of the way in which the ETF invests in the underlying shares, then the ETF will have underperformed the benchmark by around 0.1% per year. This is actually really good and is on the smaller side when it comes to tracking errors. It's worth noting, however, though, that this really depends on the time frame that you're choosing to look at, just like the annualized return. I could have easily said that in the last five years, the fund has underperformed the benchmark by around 0.69%, because that's true. It all just depends on the time frame that you're choosing to look at. When looking at tracking errors, I would suggest looking at them from inception or from a fixed date, say five years, so that you can compare them fairly across multiple ETFs. This is because each of the ETFs might have different inception dates, and so you're comparing different time periods. It's really good to look at it from inception if you're just looking at one ETF, but if you're looking to compare multiple ones, it's best to choose a fixed time frame just so you can compare them fairly because it really does make a huge difference if you're looking at five years, 10 years, since inception, and so on. So back to the ETF. Well, the tracking error is there because of the fees that the ETF charges. And these are fairly high, to be honest, for this ETF at 0.69% per year. Now, I know that doesn't actually sound much, but if you're familiar with the concept of compounding, then over a 50 year time frame, this really makes a huge difference. For comparison, the Vanguard ETF, which tracks the S&P 500 VUSA, has an expense ratio of 0.07%. It's just so much smaller. Now, I'm sure you're screaming at me, telling me this is not a fair comparison. And you're 100% correct, it's not. Emerging markets do tend to have higher expense ratios just because the research costs are so much greater. And so these are passed on to you and I as individual investors. A fairer comparison would be with another emerging market ETF, such as the Vanguard Emerging Markets ETF, VFEM, with an expense ratio of 0.22%. Or we could compare it with another very similar ETF by Invesco, which just tracks the India market. The ETF is PIN, P -I -N, and it has an expense ratio of 0.78%. Overall, the iShares ETF has an expense ratio which seems reasonable, considering it's just tracking a single emerging market. It definitely seems like it's on the high side though when compared against some of the wider ETFs tracking emerging markets as a whole. But is it actually worth this extra cost then? Well, the net assets in the fund are $2.8 billion. So clearly a lot of investors think so. This just means that you won't have any difficulty in buying and selling the ETF, especially in times of hardship where this is particularly important for ETFs to have good liquidity. The ETF, which I mentioned earlier by Invesco, PIN, PIN, have net assets of $85 million. So clearly there's a huge difference there. And this really paints a picture of the iShares ETF being a more favorable investment. I also think that the ETF has exceptional growth prospects over the long term. If I'm totally frank, this isn't my own conclusion. You'll be hard pressed to read any financial news without hearing all about how India is becoming the next China. 
is part of the BRIC group. That just stands for Brazil, Russia, India, and China. And these are the four countries which are well on their way to becoming developed nations. With India having a population of 1.4 billion people, that's just behind China, and also having the advantage of the English language, the closest we have to a global language, then for a country as a whole, they look like a great investment opportunity. The ETF holds shares in India's largest corporations, one of which is Tata Motors, the owner of Jaguar Land Rover. The largest holding in the ETF is Reliance Industries Limited. If you haven't heard of them, they're actually a huge company, they're a Fortune 500 company, who are involved in different industries such as retail to petrochemicals to textiles, really a broad array. But they're in these industries using different brand names, which is probably why you haven't heard of them. If you invest in the ETF, about 14.2% of your money will be used to purchase shares in Reliance Industries Limited. The company is huge, and with India taking a more global perspective, then even more of these mega companies are due to come out of India going forward. As with all emerging markets, however, there are still risks with investing in ETFs such as this. One of which is corruption, which is on its way down, but of course still exists at the moment. Another risk in ETF is that it's only investing in a single market, and this market is India, so it's going to be volatile. It's still an emerging market, so there's gonna be plenty of ups and downs along the way. The largest concern, however, is actually that the growth of India isn't necessarily translated into financial returns in the stock market. India actually seems quite expensive when you compare it with other emerging markets in Asia. The past performance doesn't look great, and the costs are quite high when you compare it against ETFs, which are tracking a collection of emerging markets, such as the Vanguard ETF VFEM. Even when you compare it against other single market ETFs, in different markets other than India, for example, the iShares China ETF, then the past returns look a lot better elsewhere and the costs look a lot lower. Analysts argue that this is because the growth of India is already factored into the price. They basically say that since India is such an obvious country that's going to be growing over the next 20 years, then people have already thought about this and bought accordingly. Now, I think this is true to some extent, but I also think it's relative. I mean, if this has occurred with India, then it's also occurred in all of the BRIC nations. I think in the long term, however, it's still unclear, it's still unknown, which countries will grow the most over the next 20 or 50 years. We don't know which companies are going to emerge out of which countries. This means that in the short term, the returns of the ETF might not be great. In fact, they could even be negative. But in the long term, I believe that the ETF offers a fantastic opportunity to piggyback onto the growth of India as a nation. So to wrap it up, the past performance of the underlying index scores a 3 out of 10, given that it's actually negative in real terms. The tracking error is surprisingly healthy at 0.1%. Now, it's worth noting that this is likely because just the returns haven't been great, so there hasn't really been much opportunity to deviate. But regardless, it scores a 7 out of 10. The costs of the ETF are on the high side at 0.69%, but the liquidity is really, really strong, given that it's just tracking a single market. And so it scores a 6 out of 10. For the risk and the opportunities, it scores an 8 out of 10. This is because, yes, there are risks there, but you won't be investing in an ETF like this, which tracks the single emerging market, if you wasn't comfortable taking on board some sort of risk. The opportunities, however, I believe far outweigh these risks. The opportunities to piggyback onto the growth of India is a fantastic opportunity. I'm going to be investing in this ETF myself. If you're interested to find out what strategy I'm following and how I'm going to figure out when the time is right to invest in this ETF and other ETFs like this, then keep an eye on the channel. I tend to alternate between ETF reviews like this one and wider topics such as ETF strategies, like the one I did last week on the averaging down strategy. I'd love to hear more about the strategy that you're following and which ETFs you think are really interesting at the moment. Thank you.